So, um, let's see, who do we want to go to? Uh, Andrew Adams, tell us a little bit about you and um, where you're at and what's your biggest uh, prayer need right now. Uh, can you uh, call on me next? I'm in the car right now. I'm almost home. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yes. Okay, let's go to Cassidy Campbell. What's up, guys? I'm Cassidy, and uh, I'm in Houston or West Houston. And uh, um, been here, I guess, uh, I've been serving with my dad. My dad uh, was the director of the House of Prayer here in Katy. And uh, he passed away uh, three weeks ago. Cassie, so, I love your dad, bro. I love it. Thanks, I love man. it. Sorry for your loss. Thanks. thanks, bro. So now I'm the new director of the Mosaic House of Prayer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so yeah. So just uh, walking through that, we have a, uh, we have a community prayer room that we provide leadership to. So we we have Mosaic as its own house of prayer. And uh, then we bring teams into a community prayer room, uh, and those are usually other churches. So we, we vary anywhere from 11 to 17 different churches throughout that do two-hour sets. Um, it's a beautiful freaking mess. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, it's like I would never recommend anyone ever, ever to do this, right? <laughs> but, man, it is like just we are growing in unity together in our city and um, we're just watching the Lord do some really cool things. So I, I've been married. This is my, we'll have our 25-year anniversary uh, this year. We have five daughters. Um, one is married. We have a grandson. Yeah, so we have twins that are eight. So, you know, I keep having kids. But, I mean, now we got gr our first grandkid. And I'm like, bro, this is freaking awesome, man. You know, so. So yeah, we just man, we uh, we're in a very wealthy part of Houston, and uh, when we tell people uh, we're missionaries where we're at, they're like, "What?" But you know, God loves everyone, right? He loves the wealthy man, and so we get to be in an area where we get to serve uh, a lot of people in a really cool way. Come on, bro, that's awesome. That's so cool. <laughs> Yeah, I, I lived in Houston, Katy area for a couple of years. I just, you know, it's a really cool spot. I, I like it. The Lord loves Katy, Texas. Yeah. Well, Renee, tell us a little bit about where you're at and what you're building and biggest prayer need. So good to see your face. Good to see you too, Scott. Always love uh, time to be with you. So I'm Renee Boucher. I'm in Portland, Oregon. And uh, we started a house of prayer in September of 1999. Um, out of the question we had been seeking for 10 years prior to that, of how can we see a city transformed? And uh, so the Lord gave us a strategy of night and day prayer that would birth uh, mission and justice and bring transformation to a city. We had a building in the downtown area for over five years. Uh, where we didn't get to 24 seven, but we were praying 90 plus hours a week for those five years. Then we um, moved around the city and the, we went to the north, the south, the east and the west of the metropolitan region and stayed in those areas for a year to two years each. And then we started moving into um, different local churches and their uh, prayer rooms and just establishing prayer in the local church. So we have a vision to see uh, five, what we're calling, instead of a house of prayer, we're, we're calling them prayer hubs, which would be, uh, which would hold night and day prayer, but also a resourcing and equipping center for the local church uh, in the areas of prayer, mission, and justice. Um, I facilitate a citywide prayer movement called Prayer PDX, which is one of four teams of a umbrella um, movement called Together PDX. So we have a pastor's PDX team and their tagline is no one walks alone. So they're looking to ensure that um, all pastors have relationship around them um, and are able to be an encouragement to one another and covered in prayer. 
we have Serve PDX, which is uh, looking at the collaboration of outreach and justice ministries in the city. We have Share PDX, which is looking at how we can help the local church uh, renew their passion for evangelism and teach um, just the everyday believer how to share their testimony and reach out to their neighbor. And then we have Prayer PDX, which is looking at how to build rhythms of prayer in, um, in the city, in individual lives and families in the local church, and then as a collaborative effort in the city. So there's a lot more to it, but that's um, kind of in brief summary what I'm doing here. Awesome. <laughs> that's great. All right. Thanks for, I just, Renee is one of those faithful intercessors that has just been serving the body of Christ in prophetic intercession for 30 years. You've been a school teacher. Are you still teaching school? Um, I muted myself. Sorry. No, I, I had to go when my kids, my kids are all grown now, but when they were in high school and we were looking at college, I had to go back to teaching to support my ministry habit <laughs> so, so that I could get my kids through college and have some sort of retirement um, set in place. So I did that for 12 years while also doing um, the still holding the ministry. And I knew that it was about time to leave um, teaching because some, I just felt like some new doors were going to open in terms of, of ministry. And um, so I, I also, I sit on the um, national leadership team for 24 seven prayer, if you're familiar with 24 seven mm -hmm. prayer and Pete Greg. Um, so anyway, I think it would have been hard to walk away from the salary, but uh, I ended up being in two car accidents within two years time oh that God. actually caused me to lose part of my vision for a period of time. So I had no choice but to step down um, from teaching. And then the doors flew open um, in like last year, I can't imagine having been a teacher because there were there were so many things that we were doing that were really leading the church into prayer through the pandemic and the racial reckoning and the fires and the political division and and all of uh, what we're engaged in this year. So it was just the perfect timing of the Lord um, and happened through through something that I would have rather avoided, but you know, he used it for his good purposes as always. So that was nice. Nice. Yeah. Well, thank you for your faithful service. You're a, you're a huge blessing. Anybody who's been 10 minutes with Renee, you just feel encouraged and mothered and she's just amazing. So, um, so Andrew Adams, man, it's good to see your face. It's been a long time. Tell us a little bit about what you're up to right now. I don't know. Maybe you don't remember me. Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, so right now, I do remember you. You didn't have a beard back then, but I do remember you. <laughs> um, yeah, man, we are the Dallas Fort Worth area right now, serving at the prayer room with Brad and about to transition and move back down to Galveston, which is just south of Houston. So Cassidy is a good friend of mine. And um, we were there for three years prior to being here, planting a house of prayer. And we're going back to continue that ministry. And um, yeah, that's, that's kind of what we're up to. House of prayer, prayer and worship, burn 24-7, awaken the dawn, tent America. That's, that's all of our world right now. And so we're super excited and uh, kind of a kind of a side calling. I don't know if, how to put it exactly, but um, networking, house of prayer, praying church, people across the state of Texas is uh, something that the Lord really laid on my heart about two years ago. And so it's been an amazing journey connecting. I probably connected with about 40 or 50 people across the state of Texas that are doing some form of night and day prayer and worship uh, expression in their city. So that's uh, pretty amazing. And so, yeah, we're excited. We're going to travel around the state of Texas this summer, go meet a bunch of those people and go do some Tent America stuff with them and then land back in Galveston and keep planting the house of prayer. Come on. <laughs> Come on. That's so good. That's so good. Well, Tom, tell us a little bit about you. Hey, everybody. I'm uh, Tom Spacco, and uh, I'm in northern Indiana, 
Syracuse is the name of the town. And uh, we are just getting started. In January, um, our local church started prayer room in the sanctuary during the afternoons, during the weekdays. And we do the Friday worship night every other uh, second and fourth Friday where we have kind of a kind of like an EGS service, Encountering God service has been really great. Um, but uh, we are uh, one of the sites, um, an educational partnership with IHOP. So um, IHOP is, they got their online students, but we have five full-time students here. And so they do online classes through International House of Prayer University. And then they do their prayer room and service hours here at this new uh, House of Prayer that we just started. So um yeah we are just figuring it out just getting started so i'm i'm here to learn some stuff um but so far it's been great actually it's going on right now in the background um last time i couldn't make because i was playing guitar <laughs> so yeah um but uh i will say this i do want to share uh, a testimony our friday worship nights i actually posted this on the group but since we started this we've seen Hey, there's, is that Luke? Uh -huh. Yeah, Luke's been Oh, man, Luke's, I've been needing Luke, to connect with you. This is great. Luke is, yeah, yeah, you guys are great, man. Luke's helped us get started a lot. So, yeah, here we go. We're connecting. But uh, Friday worship nights, we've seen more salvations and more baptisms in the last couple months than ever before um, since we started the prayer room. So, you know, um, praying and sharing the gospel works and, uh, and we're really trying to do both of it. I'm actually more of a, I'm more of a missions guy. It's funny. Whenever I'm in the prayer groups, they're always like, Oh, that's the evangelist missionary guy, Tom. Then whenever I'm with the missionary people, they're always like, Oh, there's that prayer guy, Tom. So I'm just, I don't know where I fit in, but, uh, but we need it all right. We need it all. We need to, we need to connect with Jesus and we need to talk to people that don't know him and, uh, plant churches and make disciples. So, that's uh, that's our story, a little bit of it. That's so funny. That's so funny. Well, um, so Richard, give us, uh, and then I'll go to Jose, and then and then we'll just um, uh, we'll launch into prayer here in just a moment. So Richard, tell us a little bit about what you're doing and, and biggest prayer need right now. All right. So uh, House of Prayer, Salem, Oregon, Capital City. Renee, you're awesome. Thank you. Yes. Um, she's on the front lines there in Portland. There's so much going on there too. Um, yeah, so I'm I'm very new, very green in this. Uh, started the end of January, and a um, little bit was shared in the beginning, but not everybody jumped on. But this house house has been here for a long time. Uh, Jim Moore helped establish it, and uh, he kind of stepped back, and it's just a changing of the guard, changing season. Um, but it's like a brand new one, so we're we're a House of Prayer that's been very established, but then at the same time, talking to Jim this morning, it's like it's like the Lord cut down the tree, and he's starting fresh again with that stump, and just doing something new and something fresh in the city, and and uh, with just a vision for and Cassidy, awesome awesome message there. But yeah, pulling the churches together because um, they are the House of Prayer, and they ought to be, and to help stand on that wall. And so anyway, so we're we're getting vision for the days ahead, and just pressing into what the Lord has and. It's been awesome. It's a tiny crew um, right now, but that's sweet and precious and uh, faith, and they're just so faithful. And so it's it's mm. been awesome. Yeah. Big prayer point, I guess, is just vision for the days ahead, and that the Lord would make that clear and uh, help us to be to do this how He wants to do it. That He would build His house of prayer. So there you go. Mm. That's good. That's, yeah. that's really good. Well, Jose, I think you get the award for being the furthest distant. So tell us about you and what you're up to, bro. Hey, guys. Uh, it's a privilege to be here. I am, I think, the, the only one uh, outside of the U.S. I am from uh, Chile. We have a house of prayer down here. Uh, I think it's just the only one. So we are, I, I, I go, went to school in uh, Georgetown College. Uh, David Broadshaw and his team came, I think like six or seven years ago, Incense and Arrows, and they gave me aware that I was to start a, a house of, a prayer room there with evangelism, and I did it, and the Lord <laughs> really blessed it, and I, uh, he sent me back to, we had a little move of, of the spirit there in my college in Kentucky, and uh, three years ago, the Lord <clears throat> sent me back to, to Chile, and uh, I 
joining a church and we started prayer meetings uh, that the, the Lord started to move and the, uh, we started growing, have more prayer meetings. And about a year ago, the pastor from the Lord here that I was and commissioned me kind of to start a house of prayer. So we have the local church still, and <clears throat> it's a vital part of everything, but also the house of prayer. And we have uh, full-time intercessors that are uh, and about six hours of prayer from Monday to Friday. And uh, yeah, we, we are being really affected by COVID. We are in lockdown right now. So all of our meetings are through Zoom. It's been really hard for us. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, for us, the, the biggest, for me uh, and for us, the, the biggest uh, prayer need, I think, is relational wisdom. I think <laughs> we are, a lot of people are jumping on the boat uh, and with enthusiasm and passion. And everybody sees the prayer room a little different <laughs> as far as expectations, forms. And it's something new for us, uh, our our culture is really passionate and, you know, and they just w want to go with everything. But, you know, for, for a house of prayer, you need to ground it in the word and you need to have sustainability and you got to do it day by day. So I we're starting an internship uh, in June and just really focusing on the first commandment. We felt that that's the Lord's direction for us. But uh, yeah, I mean, there's still every meeting, we have lots of people, lots of opinion, and people that are really passionate. So those are not always easy meetings, and there's a little bit of tension and conflict, and uh, I just, we just need grace, and uh, just this unity, and uh, just to move as a collective group of people, yeah, and that the Lord will, will guide us in every step. Uh, and I think, yeah, th I think that's, that's the greatest prayer need we have. So, yeah. Amen. Amen. That's great. Well, I think I got everybody except for me and Brad. So let me um, introduce myself and then I'll let in, uh, Brad give us a, a short little, this is what I'm doing and this is how you can pray for me. And then we'll just launch into prayer. We're going a little bit longer than that. 20 minute time frame, but I just feel it's really important to just kind of who's on the call with us and, and how can we be praying for each other. So, um, so my name is Scott Flora, uh, uh, like it says on my little tag there, that's real. Um, so uh, I'm the director of uh, Ekbalo Bend and we are a house of prayer, a discipleship training environment for young adults. So we're part of the Lou Engle family of ministries. Um, and we're uh, rooted in our local church. So I'm the prayer and missions kind of coordinator, pastor of our local church and really helping um, give leadership to um, guiding our church into becoming more of a uh, praying church. And um, so it's a real pleasure. We live in community. So we have two big houses and all of our staff and students live in two houses. And so we're a Book of Acts community. So we live together, we pray together, we learn together, grow in the knowledge of God together. We do evangelism out on the streets and do cold contact power evangelism um, on the streets. So 16, 18 hours a week of uh, music led prayer and worship with evangelism out on the streets. And then we live together. So we're, we have cook teams and cleanup teams and we're just a uh, YWAM meets IHOP in one beautiful uh, family, and it's uh, beautiful. So we go to the nation, so we're going to Nepal and planting a house of prayer in the mountains of Himalayas um, in June. We're really excited about um, uh, helping them do that in uh, Jiri, Nepal, in the middle of nowhere, eight-hour bus ride up into the mountains in the mountain of Nepal, so really a lot of fun. Um, I give leadership to the, um, uh, this side of the nation with Awaken the Dawn and Tent America. So excited to be a part of um, that. And then I get to be a part of the team that is doing the digital portion of the movement conference. And so if you're not on the digital program to be able to catch the messages, Corey Russell, um, uh, Alan Hood, 
um, Billy Humphrey, Michael Miller, Michael Colionis, all of those guys out of there. If you're, if you're not signed up for the digital movement, let me know. And I want to hook you up because these messages, I think it's going to be culture shifting. So um, biggest thing that you can pray for me on is um, just faithfulness in my family, balancing all of the hats that need to happen and doing my family well and I want to have a family that's on fire for God and not a ministry. I don't want to build a big ministry. I want to build big people. And so if you could be praying for me with that. But anyways, that's me. So Brad. So uh, Brad Stroop, the director of the Prayer Missions Base in the Dallas area. Uh, we've been going 15 years. We have been building one hour blocks and then two hour blocks. And so we're, we're 20 hours a day with live worship. I don't know how that's possible. Every time I walk in the building i'm like who are these crazy people but they're doing it 20 hours a day seven days a week so it's real uh, it's weak but it's real it never stops but it's weak man some days it's weak but uh anyway uh, it's beautiful uh, so we've got a mission space training school all real small part-time schools we got four interns right now kind of a thing but we've always got four interns or eight you know that kind of thing so every semester we've got a new group of people coming through um, my big uh, passion is actually uh, House of Prayer Consulting, so helping praying churches and uh, houses of prayer and missional communities that are trying to find a rhythm of prayer, uh, going in for a weekend and you know doing a conference and, and rallying people to build night and day prayer, and then equipping the leaders and the staff and the team to, uh, to their expression, you know, helping them figure out what are the next steps, and it's fun because we started in my living room, so I've got... Uh, a lot of history from starting off real, real small to seeing different expressions over the years. And so I just, I love it. Uh, so doing Zoom calls like this, where I get to be a part of what is going on and, and sew in a little nugget uh, is fun for me. Biggest thing for me, prayer requests would just be uh, just stewarding this season well, a lot of responsibilities. And I, I just want to stay right in alignment with the Holy Spirit. So that'd be my request. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, we've uh, taken up about 10 minutes of our, our prayer time, and I feel like it's really important just to relational. We won't do this every time, but um, I wanted to do it this time because there's so many new faces. And if there's this many new faces next time, I'm going to make a, a different kind of a shift. But I'd like to just um, invite everybody to pray, and you don't have to remember every piece, but Take a couple of minutes, 90 seconds, two minutes, and just pray as you feel led. And then, um, Brad, if you could pray last, um, and right at about um, 20 tell, I want to transition um, to Brad. And Brad is prepared, and he is an exhortation, uh, an impartation for us. And so I want to transition right at um, a 20 tell. So let's just take about 10 minutes and pray for each other and um, kind of go from there. So um, I'll, I'll start, and Brad, if you want to finish. Lord, I just thank you for um, Renee, how you placed her in um, Portland, in the middle of all of the ugly of um, culture. And God, I'm asking that you would give them strategy. Would you download, Lord, to them um, what their next is? Lord, would you give them, um, I want to pray for their prayers. Would you download to them prophetic um, um, intercessions? Would you, would you mark them with a spirit of grace on their life that they know what to pray and how to pray in the moment that would break through and break off and break into their next? So God, in the name of Jesus, I just bless Renee and everything that she's doing in Portland, Oregon. Lord, I just want to pray for Cassidy, God, and Katie, and the work that's going on there, Lord. I pray that you would bless their house of prayer. Bless, God, the heritage, the, the sowing in, the godly life of Randy, God, and all that he's done, and the family that he's raised up. And now Cassidy serving in that role as director, that seems so right and fitting to me. I pray that you would Bless him in his leadership. Bless him in his new relationships, in his new endeavors, in his new efforts, new energies. I pray, God, that you bless everything he puts his hand to and that that house of prayer, Father, would flourish 
in this season, that you'd even give them new instructions about the steps that they are to take. God bless the Mosaic House of Prayer uh, and, and Cassidy and his family, his growing family. Bless them in this season in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, I pray uh, for Jose and Chile right now. God, I ask that you mm -hmm. would um, give revelation to the wineskin and the thorn so that all this passion wouldn't be spilled out all over the place, but it'd be funneled and focused and it would accomplish your purposes, God. I, I just pray for a spirit of unity, uh, a bond of peace, uh, harmony, gentleness, God. I pray uh, there would be seeking to understand one another, God. And I thank you, Lord. I thank you for the fire and I thank you for the passion, God. And I just pray... Yeah that you would um, speak to each one, Lord, and, and, and show what, what this looks like for them, God, the wineskin, Lord. So I'm, I'm praying and asking for unity and revelation for the whole, the whole tribe, the whole group, Lord, all of them to be on the same page. And, and just uh, give give Jose wisdom, Lord, and, and patience. And um, yeah, we just thank you for him. We just pray grace mm -hmm. upon him to lead, keep leading forward, Lord, in your ways. In Jesus' yeah. name. And I just pray for Richard right now. I just pray, God, just in their uh, transition. And God, just, I pray blueprint, Lord, a blueprint into the intimacy of God, a blueprint, God, and the sustainability, the beauty of Jesus, God, that you would wreck their house of prayer, God, with a whole new uh, revelation of the beauty of Jesus, the delight that he, that you experience and, and encounter each one of them, God, Lord, I pray that they would have dreams of you laughing over them, you singing over them, you whistling, dancing, God. Lord, we pray that they would actually see these things in their, their services, in their, their prayer sets, God. Lord, we, we pray, Lord, that there would be just a, a whole movement of tears in Salem, Oregon, God. Tears yeah. of joy, tears of weeping, God, tears of longing, God, we just pray. Lord, for a fresh wind, God, a fresh revelation of you, Papa. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Father, I just want to pray for both Scott and for Brad. Um, at this time, just leaders of the leaders, Lord, the apostolic calling that mm. is on their life to see prayer raised up throughout the nation um, and beyond. And I just think of, of the portion of Isaiah 61 that says they will be oaks of righteousness the planting of the Lord that mm. he may be glorified we pray that their roots would go down deep Lord that they would stand tall that when um, they walk into the room that the glory of the Lord would be seen as they carry your presence into mm. those places and then it says they shall rebuild the old ruins and raise up the former desolations they shall repair the ruined cities the desolations of many generations and if there's ever a time in our lifetime for this scripture it's now yeah. and so father i just ask that that as we move forward as we come out of this last year uh, and and months father that that you would um help us to rebuild the old ruins, that we would see the former desolations raised up and repaired, mm -hmm. the desolations of many generations, God, that, that you would bring the healing. And Father, I pray for Scott and for Brad. Mm -hmm. I pray for new revelation, for new strategies, God, that even in the house of prayer, Father, that you would be pouring in the new, that we would not be settled into into the the structure that has been formed without continually seeking you for the new as you want to move us forward in the days ahead and mm -hmm. and so i just ask for a release of the new in the season that we're moving into for both scott and brad to lead mm -hmm. out that the age old um cities and the generations and the foundations would be relayed and repaired in Jesus' mm. name. Yes, yes. Father, I want to pray for Scott and for Cassidy, and I thank you for 
their faithfulness and their families and Father, their, their children, I pray that you would put out fire, fire on their children. You would ignite a, a greater passion for Jesus. I pray that you would Lord, release a greater measure of their prophetic spirit, Lord, that they will all see what you're doing. They will all jump in, Lord, into what you're doing, that they can do this together, God, and, and see what you're seeing, Father. And I pray that you would even use their children to lift their arms uh, in, and give them words, God, that will just warm their hearts, God, and confirm that you are moving in them and that you are working in them, Father. And I pray that you will bless them and that they will walk, God, healthy in family and in ministry and every area. In Jesus' name. God, for Tom, God, in Indiana, Lord, I just ask you for a fresh grace, Lord, as they step in and they've launched this prayer room. And um, Lord, just increase upon increase of your presence, of dreams and visions, of revelation. God, that their, their church would be transformed, their city would begin to see that glorious transformation, Lord, as they go out to proclaim Christ. Lord, just the exponential growth of your work in hearts and lives would be clearly manifest. Lord, we ask for signs and wonders that you'd confirm your word with signs following, that you would establish that house of prayer in glory. God, pour out upon them every need, every need be met in the name of Jesus. God, release your grace and hold them up with your mighty right hand in Jesus' name. Thank you, God. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Sure. Well, Andrew, would you like to uh, pray for us real quick and then we'll transition? Absolutely. Cool. Uh, well, Father, I just um, I just pray for this. Uh, network of House of Prayer leaders. Um, I mean, you know, my heart is just just the, the family of, of leaders, the family of those that have uh, made this, uh, this have, have said this yes to you, to to follow you, to um, to give you this sacrifice, and to um, to take our families along the journey, and to to really carry our cities and our regions, our states, our nations, and our in our heart. Um, and so we ask you for grace on each one of these leaders. Uh, we pray for vision. Mm -hmm. We pray for humility. We pray for grace to, to lead and to serve. Um, and above it all, we ask you for encounter with you, Lord, that, that everything we do is it's not just ministry, but it's, it's really unto loving you with all that we are, all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And so we just pray grace on all of these um, as they... As they say yes to you, we always ask you for grace in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, Andrew, thanks for praying for us. And, um, you know, I want to tell you, I, I feel like it's a, it's a real privilege and um, it's a joy for me every time I get to uh, take some of the journey we've been on for 15 years, some of the lessons that our team has learned and share them. And, you know, I always tell people, um, even bad ideas have value because uh, you can make a bad idea good. So, you know, I don't uh, necessarily think that, uh, you know, our journey is so different than uh, anybody else's, but we've been on it for a while. And so if there are some things that I can, you know, just share about what we've done uh, that could, you know, provoke or encourage an idea, a different, you know, idea or whatever, that's really my hope today. And so anyway, it's a privilege to be able to uh, throw out a nugget or two. And um, what I want to do is just to jump in, talking about the importance of shared leadership. Um, it's uh, some, it's a lot of lessons I've learned um, over the years. And, and um, you know, as busy leaders, there's only so much that we can get done by ourselves. And uh, I want to give just a, a few of the little things that the Lord taught us. Um, you know, I, I want to give the context. We started the house of prayer in my living room and we were doing daily prayer meetings every morning, every night for three years in my living room. So we didn't have a building. 
I didn't have any ministry training. I didn't know what we were doing. I, I mean, I, I didn't have any connections up at IHOP. Um, I knew IHOP existed, but we were just learning. Like, how do you build the house of prayer? And there was there were no notes or handbooks or anything out there. I mean, it was just like, just rough and ugly trying to figure it out. And uh, and so I did a lot of praying, oh God, help me not do anything stupid. That was really my, my main ministry model, uh, was praying that all the time as we were trying to learn what we were doing. But, but I figured out a couple of things, uh, some of which by falling on my face first. But the biggest ache for all of us as House of Prayer directors and praying church uh, pastors and whatever our uh, title might be, our biggest ache related to prayer is human resources. All of us are trying to figure out how to get more, how to utilize the one we have, the ones we have, all of that. And I, I want to uh, give us maybe a little bit of a perspective shift that all of us have leaders have, as leaders have thought of before. I just want to re-highlight a perspective shift instead of the lack of how many we don't have to back on the ones that we do. And back on the ones that uh, back on something that we can control. We can't necessarily control how many come to us, but we can control how much we invest into the ones that are with us now. And uh, I want to think about things from the standpoint of how much training, how much equipping, how much mentorship to build prayer are we offering the handful of people that we actually already have in our midst? Uh, what are we doing to think of them as uh, leaders? Um, just as a little point of uh, comparison that I know all of us have thought of at one point or another, but I think will be helpful for our conversation. <clears throat> the, the difference between the normal local church ministry model and whatever it is that we're building, whatever wild, crazy thing that is, the difference in number of hours of ministry time. I mean, when you think of a local church, there's a Sunday morning church expression, so one hour, two hours, maybe three if they're doing two services. Uh, maybe there's a Wednesday night thing. You know, maybe there's one other two other little things. But you've got like five hours a week of ministry time, like live. It's go time. The staff is supposed to be ministering. The house of prayer, man, we've turned that thing upside down. We've got five, you know, two hour prayer meetings a week, plus this, plus, I mean, we've got twice as many or three times or 10 times or a hundred times as many hours of like the ministers need to be on doing the ministry thing. And so, you know, we're, we had better be professionals at recruiting leaders because we have too many live hours a week going on that we need um, trained humans doing something uh, ministry wise. And, uh, and so, uh, so we've got to learn how to delegate. And I know that's something that we're all working on, but I just have some thoughts and some, some ideas. We need more leaders. And really, in all honesty, as best as we can, those of us on this call and those that fit that senior leadership role, we really need to be managers. I mean, loving people, but we need to figure out how to manage people, get people do the work of the ministry. You know, the fivefold ministry calling, we all know it, but it's actually God gave those leaders not to do the work, but to equip the saints to do the work. And so if we're too busy doing the work, we're probably not real busy equipping people to do the work. And then it's going to get bottlenecked quick. And I've just found over the years that if I will invest more energy in training and equipping and being a manager with a happy heart in God, things will actually go further. But the problem is as a control freak, I got any other control freaks on the call? Is it just me? Uh, as a control freak, we don't wanna let go because we're afraid they won't do it as good as we will. And our fear is warranted. They will not do it as well as we will. Let's just settle it. They're gonna do it terribly. It's gonna be horrible the first time. And, and not quite as horrible the second time and a little better by the 10th time. And by time 20, they got it. They still don't do it as good as we would, but we were freed up to go do something else because we were empowering them to do it. And, and we just got to get over that control freak thing. We just got to let it go. We need to delegate our responsibilities. What I always encourage leaders to do um, is make a list, uh, write it out, write out every, what are all your responsibilities? Write all of them down on a piece of paper or a Word doc or a notes pad in your phone. Write out all of your responsibilities and then constantly be hunting. 
four people who could take one of those things off your plate. Just one. Maybe they couldn't take 10, but they could do one. You know, just start looking for who could take that one thing. And you might, you might even look at it and go, man, that one thing really doesn't free me up that much. But if you could find 10 people to take one thing, that would help you. And, and just constantly thinking that direction uh, just as kind of a broad strokes. But, but let me go where the real meat is today as far as uh, what I feel like the, the Lord gave me to give you, you guys and for us to have today. Just a couple of lessons that I felt like the Lord gave me. And, you know, the Lord speaks to us in parables that our own heart understands. He speaks to us in language that is meaningful to us. And so uh, if what I'm about to say that I feel like the Lord told me years and years and years ago, if it's a little offensive to you, just know he was talking to me, not to you, okay? Uh, I was in a mess, man. We were trying to expand prayer meetings in my living room. I was the prayer leader all 14 prayer meetings a week all seven mornings, all seven nights. I was the prayer leader. I was the only one doing anything. And I was like, Lord, we got to fix this. And I, I was concerned because the leader, uh, the, the people in my midst, they, they didn't have any leadership experience. They were all young adults. They were all just, I mean, half of them were barely saved. You know, a few of them were walking with the Lord, but didn't have any practical experience. And I was praying. I was like, Lord, what am I going to do? And I just heard the Lord tell me bad leadership is better than no leadership at all. I was like, man, that, that's real. <laughs> and then I, I approached him again and I heard him say, inexperienced leadership is so much better than no leadership at all. Just train them. And so what I started to do was, you know, not in the area of character. I think any leader needs to have a measure of character. Or it's not, you're going down the wrong direction. But inexperienced, they say things the wrong way. They say things so offensively. They're totally not mindful of people at all. They don't care about people's emotions. They're, but just, it's a lot of immaturity. I just started to go, you know what? I'm going to get some leaders in place. I'm going to call them leaders. I'm going to call them to some leadership qualifications. I'm going to call them to some leadership expectations. And none of them are ready. Not a one of them. They're all totally not ready for leadership. But I'm not going to set the bar this high. I'll set the bar this high. Uh, but I put about 10 young adults into positions of leadership. I started calling them leaders, started giving them leadership responsibilities, but their leadership responsibilities were very limited. And uh, I encourage people all the time, if you don't have any leaders, raise them up. You do have leaders. They're just, they're in seed form right now. They're immature uh, and, and they just need some limited responsibility with a little bit of TLC, a little bit of follow-up and, and help them succeed. And so that's what I started to do was I gave a handful of leaders uh, some limited responsibility and, uh, and they weren't doing it awesome at, at the beginning, I, but I stuck with them. Um, another phrase in that, in that uh, season of time that really came to mind related to my thought process about always trying to raise up leaders from nothing, uh, nothing meaning they don't have any previous leadership experience, you know, they love the Lord. Um, was I just had this phrase, I don't know if the Lord gave it to me or if it was, uh, you know, an old movie quote, I don't know, but it was, it seemed like the Lord to me. I just felt like one day I was like, the Calvary isn't coming. There is no Calvary. They're never coming. If we're going to win this war, it's not going to be because a bunch of troops showed up on our shores. It's going to be because we armed our guys with sticks and rocks and we fought back. And I just had this sense, the Calvary is never coming. And that just, I don't know, for me, it was so freeing to stop thinking like one day a bunch of people are just going to show up and fix all my problems. One day, a bunch of worship leaders are just going to magically appear. One day, you know, a, a group of leaders will come in and it'll all work out perfect. I was like, the Calvary's not, there is no Calvary. So if, if there will ever be a leader in our midst, it's going to be because I invested in them and made them a leader. And if there's no leaders in five years, there's nobody's fault except mine because I didn't raise up leaders. And man, I remember in those early days when we didn't have any leaders, I felt the pain of it every single day. I said, you know what? We're going to raise up leaders. So we, I just started this thought process and encourage all of you, wherever you're at in your various you know, uh, ministry expressions and even phases of building, because we're still doing this. I mean, we were having a meeting yesterday talking about how do we raise up more leaders? This is kind of a constant ongoing conversation because you're always 
sewing into your future, uh, you know, uh, uh, abilities and and capacity and bandwidth by raising up leaders today. You're always sewing into your future. How many more prayer meetings? How many more live hours of worship? How many more outreaches? How many more opportunities will you have in a year and in five years? Has everything to do with how many leaders you're investing in right now. So organizing people to start leading something. Um, I'm real big on giving people some responsibility, even if it's really small, but give it to them and tell them it's theirs and then help them become successful at that. And, you know, I think there's a lot that we can learn uh, really from just the, the secular uh, business place. I mean, how many people start off as the, the sweeper at McDonald's and then they get moved up. If they were faithful with little, they get moved up from the guy who sweeps the floors to now they're the ones that take the orders. And then if they do good at that, well, now they're you know considered for a shift manager. And if they're good at that, then they're considered for... I just feel like we need to start thinking real simple. And how do I make somebody a leader over the bathroom? You're the bathroom leader, man. You lead that bathroom the best that it's ever been led. And if you lead that bathroom good, uh, you know, in a year we can talk. And just figuring out how to impart um, real responsibility to people and then empower them and see how they do and then, and then give them something else and give them something else. For me, I just feel like whatever it is that we empower them in has so little uh it doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter if you give them the bathroom or you give them the coffee bar or you give them, go talk to that visitor. And then next week, go talk to the next visitor. And next week, go talk. Really, whatever position we give them, it really is, doesn't matter. It's the faithful with little, faithful with much. It's a breeding ground, a testing ground. If we give them little and they're faithful, then we can know we can trust them with more. And now we can start giving them real ministry, real ministry assignments. Hey, now would you be the prayer leader on a set? Now, would you train the next prayer leader? Would you now train all our prayer leaders? Would you now be the, the head trainer? I mean, but it's a progressive uh, of system uh, of, of helping people um, take those steps. And in my experience, uh, what is most natural for us as leaders, we want to look for the head prayer leader day one, instead of looking for the bathroom cleaner day one, to see if they'll be faithful with that, to then promote to filling in the prayer lead one time to then promote, to then promote, to then promote it. And so I, I've just seen this work for us. And so we've got, uh, you know, part of the way we operate 140 hours a week of live worship is through this process. We've only got nine missionaries. We have nine intercessory missionaries. I'm one of them. I'm not even a worship leader. So we've only got eight useful people, you know, and, and then me, and it's like eight missionaries but we've got 140 hours a week of live worship. It's, we've gotten really good at this whole concept of empowering leaders and delegating responsibility and, and looking for, you know, the little signs of life and signs of leadership to, you know what, in six weeks, six months, we need to put that guy over that team instead of having him serve in this way, but all starting with the entry level service stuff. And so whether that's spiritual stuff or non-spiritual stuff, um, I just want to encourage us to, Start giving uh, the ones that are with us, because all of us have people that are on our shores right now, giving the ones that are with us some limited level of responsibility and then inspecting how they do and check in with them and, and then empower them to be successful. And I think if we'll set ourselves up with the following expectation, I think it'll cause all of us to not cuss. Okay, let's expect them to fail. <laughs> let's expect them to botch it, to mess stuff up, to break the thing, to do us wrong, to say the wrong thing to the wrong person and make somebody cry. Let's expect it. And then because we're, because we want to be fathers, let's go set them up to be successful. And then if, and when they fail, let's help them be more successful the next time so that they're able to be successful the second time, the fifth time. And then uh, let's bear with them so that they'll do even better. Uh, I don't think we need great leaders initially. I think we need willing helpers. And as long as we have willing helpers, we can form great leaders because we know how to help. Uh, we know how to get people who are willing helpers,
doing stuff. Well, let's empower them to do stuff and then promote them over time and they'll become great leaders under our care. And here's, here's one thing. I was on the phone with a uh, pastor earlier today. He was so frustrated. Uh, he was frustrated because he went into a ministry and he had all these leaders that didn't have his DNA. And, uh, and he was trying to get them to, you know, do certain things. And, and they just, it was such a, a, a head clash, you know, butting heads, clash, clash, clash. That over the course of about three years, two to three years of ministering there, this pastor actually put in his resignation and said, I, I just can't do it anymore. Well, let me just tell you the model of ministry that I just painted. You'll never have that problem because they'll all have your DNA. You're not bringing in leaders from afar. You're forging them. You're making them. And they'll become great leaders under your care. And where this leads is over time, they're going to rise to the occasion. Some of them will go off and plant other things. Uh, some of them will be excellent leaders in your midst for forever. But as long as they're with you, they'll be perpetuating a system of enlisting the new visitor to start helping, to start being involved, to start being engaged. And, and, uh, and so I've got a lot of other ideas on where all that can go you know, later on. But like I said, this is, I love doing this. I love just to, to throw out ideas. And, you know, I know many of you were kind of nodding your head and stuff. And probably some of it was like, man, the thing Brad just said was a terrible plan. But if I tweak it just a little bit, now I have a good idea. I'm all on board with that, man. I will be the dummy any day to come up with the dumb idea that you can make better because you're all leaders that love Jesus. And you've got the Holy Spirit. And, and as long as I just keep talking, uh, maybe something will land. And so uh, anyway, I just wanted to uh, throw those ideas out and and thank you guys for what you do, and uh, and hopefully be uh, be an encouragement to you. I'll, I'll hand the meeting back over to Scott. Bless you guys. <laughs> I think all of us are going, man. I need uh, I need to do this better, or I need to like create, you know, little like I never even thought of, you know, the bathroom captain. That's just amazing. So <laughs> I love it. I love it. So um, yeah, um. I want to honor all of your guys' times, but if you have a burning question that you want to ask Brad, I would love to just give you a moment to just say, hey, Brad, what would you do about this? And let him answer. So if you have one of those questions right now, just go ahead and fire it off. I'll give you a couple of minutes. See, like I said, I throw out a bunch of bad ideas. They make them better. They don't have any questions. Uh, they really fixed it. Uh, I, I, I would like to ask a question. And uh, thank you, Brad. That, that was really great. Uh, but, well, the, the, the classical thing, I actually hear this a lot, especially now that we have so many people that actually want to be leaders. But the classical question about how, how do you keep people from really like, uh, you give them a little bit of leadership and they kind of, Take over the, take over the house, and especially people that have been in ministry, and, and you're trying to uh, form, a kind of disciple them into a DNA or a vision, uh, but they have been in leadership, so they are kind of ready in some elements, but you know, they are still have to learn in others. So how kind of you, can you balance that? If you have any thoughts. Yeah. Well, uh, first thing I would say is. Uh, I, I don't think it's the best game plan to empower one or two or three people with a lot of responsibility. I think you're way better off to, to empower 10 people with a little responsibility. And part of what that does is it shares the load, it shares the leadership, but it also causes everybody to start to realize they've got peers in leadership and it's not about them being number two to you. And so, uh, so I think that helps with that. Um, and then, you know, I think, I think as leaders, we need to be bold and courageous that when there's something out of place in a leader in our midst, we need to sweetly tell them so. <laughs> I mean, if it's ambition or if it's, you know, arrogance or if it's whatever, I think we need to sweetly be able to communicate and pull them aside and say, listen, bro, sis, I love you. You're amazing. Uh, here are the gifts that I see budding in you. But let me tell you about this blind spot and it's going to bite you. And I want to let you know that I see it because as a father in this house, I, I don't want to see that thing get out of place and become inappropriate. And so I want to let you know I see it and that I'm going to be praying for you to get stronger and, 
and for you to be balanced in that area. And I'll do everything I can to help you. Uh, so I think the balance of a group of peers being uh, empowered into leadership, as opposed to just empowering one or two, uh, you know, a small number, uh, I think that's helpful. I think also as leaders, we need to take the uh, responsibility as fathers. And when we see things that are out of place, before that thing rears its head and does something destructive in our midst, I think we need to pull them aside and say, listen, I see this thing. Uh, it's, uh, it's Satan trying to tempt you. And I love you too much to not say something. So uh, those are hard conversations. But honestly, that's discipleship. And man, you can make a friend for life by being the one to point out a blind spot. You can also wind up chasing off some people that you will be very glad you chased off by you being transparent and coming to them and, uh, and bringing, again, sweetly, uh, bringing to their attention an area that's, that's a real problem. Uh, some of them will leave. And we need, to not, um, we need to not try to hold on to those the Lord is sparing us uh, from by him moving on by us, uh, by holding, we don't want to hold too tightly. And so I always encourage people, this is a great ministry model of leadership of how we hold our people just enough that they don't roll off the sides, but not like this, that it's controlling or keeping things in place that actually would be better someplace else. I don't know if that was helpful, but yeah. One Thank of the things you. that has really helped um, us is a clearly written job description with um, with timelines, deadlines, and then also if it doesn't get done, what happens next? What are next steps? And then um, those are those are massive. Those are massive. Well, listen, it's um, four minutes after. I want to honor you guys' time. We're all busy. Brad's busy. We could probably have a time. And I know that um, Brad's dream and, and I share in the intercession of that dream is to have some sort of a gathering where we meet down at um, in Dallas-Fort Worth area for a weekend of 40, 60, 80, uh, 100 House of Prayer leaders from all over America and share the space together and go deep in friendship and do more of this type of, of um, sharing and teaching and learning and growing together. And so I'm excited you guys uh, joined with us. Thank you for your time and um, comment on the Facebook page. Um, I'm going to post this. Um, uh, and yeah, Brad just put his um, email. So I put my email in the thread. Brad is, is his. If you have any questions at all, let us answer some of those questions. Um, and uh, I'll just say a, a blessing over you. God, thank you for these amazing leaders and the ones that will listen to it time shifted in next week or next month. So God, I just ask right now that we want to stay the course long term. We want to be a part of your blueprints to raise up night and day prayer, a house of prayer for all nations. God, we want to be a part of what you're doing. And so, God, we've said yes to this. And so, God, would you continue to empower us to love, empower us to build the people that you put us in, uh, in front of. God, we want to do leadership. We want to do ministry like you did leadership and ministry. We want to do it like you, calling people higher, emotionally healthy. God, in the name of Jesus, bring us into family. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, bless okay, you guys. You guys are awesome. Thanks, you guys. Amazing. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much. Blessing. Awesome work, Brad. You guys take care. Thank you, guys. Amazing.